Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take bed sites and apply to all things plants. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about rock dust. So this is a highly requested video and I actually mentioned it recently in a podcast I was a part of, um, the Jane Perone on the Ledge podcast. And that's mostly for houseplant people, but we were talking about ways to supplement the soil and rock dust did come up in the conversation. So I thought we'd go through it a little bit. Um, some of the overinflated claims of the product, but as well as the role or the purpose the product does play and why as a houseplant person or as a gardener, you may want to consider the use of the product in and of itself. So let's just get straight into it. Now I do have a house plant planner and in it I do discuss some things you can do to test your soil um, just to see what level your mix is at, how useful it is, how well it drains, um, how microbially active it is, that sort of thing. So you can uh, grab that house plant planner either on Etsy or as a PDF copy over on Amazon, but I'll leave the links for that down below. So rock dust is basically silicate rock that has been ground down into a fine powder. So it's giant rocks being made into little microscopic tiny rocks. And it's kind of a natural weathering process that just takes place with the earth's crust. So two really common options is limestone and then also phosphorus or phosphorus rock. Now those two options have about 70, 74, didn't want to mess it up, 74 different types of minerals ranging from obviously the 17 essentials if you watch the plant series, things like calcium, magnesium, manganese, molybdenum, iron, that sort of thing. But the other 74 would be like silicate and <laughs> all these really exotic things on the periodic table that us as plant people really don't care about and don't really serve any purpose to either our soil or to our plant. But these overabundance in nutrients doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing because it doesn't harm and it also doesn't harm plants, soil or plants either way. So while it doesn't have a benefit, there is no harmful side to using the product. So when we add rock dust into our house plants or into our soil, we can use two really easy products to find such as gypsum and lime. So these are also rock, rock dust. They're just not marketed as pretty as the actual rock dust product but they have the same essential nutrients in them, uh, same wide range of essential nutrients. And so they serve the same purpose. Now the benefit to using a gypsum or lime rock dust is that we can actually adjust our pH. So if we are using a potting soil, which is relatively acidic, if you're using coconut coir or if you're using uh, peat, both tend to be a little bit more on the acidic side. We could use something like lime to actually raise the pH while still supplying some extra minerals into the mix. The other option would be gypsum and this be me more applicable to the outdoor gardener folk who are looking to lower the pH. Maybe you have an acid loving plant, that sort of thing. You would add the gypsum to that soil to bring that pH down. And I've mentioned this in several different videos, um, including a houseplant one and a gardener's one. So just check those out if you want a little bit more information on exactly how and why that does work. So with that being said, that means the generic rock dust you buy is heavily marketed as this miracle product that supplies essential uh, nutrients or hard to find nutrients that aren't available in the soils and aren't available in potting soil. So the claim of it not being available in potting soil is probably relative considering potting soil is a soilless mix, meaning it doesn't have topsoil or earth in it. Uh, for the garden people, especially those of us here in North America, I mean, the claim is a little weak because a lot of our soil, all of our soil, whether it be sandy clay, silt, or somewhere in between all those has been basically ground down bedrock that the glaciers put a ton of work into. So that means that the nutrients in both the soil and the rock dust are going to be relatively similar. 
things like calcium and magnesium deficiencies should not be happening in your garden soil. Um, they may happen in heavy production, such as in an agriculture production scenario, but your garden should never be lacking these nutrients. If you're noticing deficiencies in this, it's actually likely your pH. But if you're noticing deficiencies in calcium or magnesium, things of that nature in your house plants, it actually maybe because it's absent. But with that being said, rock dust does need to go through a certain level of mineralization and bioavailability transfer, meaning we need some microbes to do a little bit of leg work for us. So that nutrient release is not quick. And by not quick, I mean can take decades to be achieved. Now there'll be some minor levels of calcium that are available because calcium is relatively water soluble. So it's pretty quickly picked up from the rock dust, but I would actually aim or get you guys to think about rock dust more as a way to correct our soil pH, both in the potting soil and in the garden, but uh, not so much as a nutrient type thing because it's not, it's just it takes way too long. And by long, I mean your kids, kids aren't gonna really see the benefits of it. So just something to keep in mind. I looked through a ton of studies on this, none of which alluded to any miracle yield increases due to nutrient uptake. There was lots that said that nutrient or that um, yield increases were three times higher in the fields that had rock dust applied. Now. I would think that that increase or that change maybe because they actually adjusted the pH into a nutrient bioavailability realm more so, um, and they do talk about that in the study. I would assume that's more the case rather than just all this huge influx of 74 minerals, most of which are useless to the plant. Um, that's a little bit where I would go. Now, what I would have liked to see from the studies and I know costs and stuff obviously inhibit a lot of the, the scientific papers from doing this, but a biomass, either above ground or below ground, uh, between the control and the rock dust option field would have been nice to see because then we would have saw if there was maybe an uptick in the biomass holding calcium, magnesium, um, things like that, which would have been cool, but they did not do that. So I can't say definitively that there is, you know, excess of these nutrients in there and that's what caused this massive yield increase. However, one thing that they are realizing when it comes to rock dust, especially in an outdoor situation, even in an indoor situation for that matter, is that when it is applied, it actually increases the soil's ability to capture CO2, which is really, really cool. Um, farmers currently in Canada, and I'm assuming it's the same in the US, actually majority of the world, farmers get hit with carbon tax, but they don't get carbon credits for sequestering carbon. So I mean, kind of a, eh, but if they did get carbon credits, I mean, there would be a reason to invest in actually applying rock dust. So I wanna just read out um, what the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, said about rock dust. So they say that rock dust naturally is able to remove one gigaton or 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide from the year, from the atmosphere in a year, which is crazy. So that means if it was applied to uh, like mass produced farm land, uh, we would maybe see some extra carbon sequestration. The other study that I actually looked at that's really kind of cool is if you are uh, composting cattle manure, or if you are top dressing with manures and compost, if you ever top dress with manures or compost, it's always manure and then compost because manure is, it volatilizes. So it releases a lot of gas. And so if you ever bought like the Earth's Medicine product that I have spoken about on the channel, not sponsored, not affiliate even. Um, if you crack the top and the bottle, sometimes you'll notice there's almost like a gas release. That's NH4, that's of volatilized nitrogen. And so to reduce those losses of nitrogen and essentially reduce the loss in um, fertilizer is what it comes down to, you can actually add rock dust to your manure to help keep it in because there's studies showing that it doesn't volatilize nitrogen off as easily when we have that kind of setup. So that's actually kind of really cool too. So if you were to use rock dust in that application, it would be manure, rock dust and then compost and if you are starting a new bed my personal actually no i'm gonna 
I'm gonna bump that up. My soil scientist recommendation is that we add a layer of manure, a layer of rock dust, test your soil first below the manure layer. Um, see if it's high or low. If it's high or low, then we're gonna use the rock dust, either gypsum or lime, respectively speaking. And then we're gonna put compost on top of that and we're gonna rototill that in um, about 12 to 15-ish inches in depth. And then you will have an awesome, awesome garden going forward. So that's all I have for you guys on rock dust here today. Like I said, I wouldn't focus too much on this miracle amount of mineral being added your main focus should actually be on the fact that it's adjusting the pH which is its true benefit that you're going to be able to unlock within your lifetime most rock dust you're not going to see the benefits until like your kids 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 have children unfortunately so I want to thank you guys for watching be sure to give the video a thumbs up hit that subscribe button let me know in the comments down below what you want to see next I will talk to you guys next time bye